Hey everybody, it is Miss Webb and we are going to talk about chapter 14 today. So these are covering what we call our uncollectible accounts or, or bad debts. So anytime we have customers, there are always going to be a chance that our customers for some reason when they charge end up not paying us. And so we are going those are losses that we're going to take as a business and it gives us a list of customers that we you know learn not to extend credit to and so we need to talk about how we're going to account for those so the first part of chapter 14 is we're talking about the explanation of the purpose for that allowance method um, estimating the uncollectible accounts expense using the aging method and then recording some adjusting entries. So let's go ahead and get started. So uncollectibles account, the uncollectible account, this is all part of your vocab, are just those accounts receivables that we haven't been able to collect from. So we've sent letters, we've sent, you know, emails, we've sent invoices to our customers, and for some reason they just haven't paid us. So, um, like I said, we also can refer to those as bad debts. That's an, you know, it's kind of interchangeable. Uh, it was bad debts a long time ago, but they still kind of use that term now. And then there's a couple of different methods that we're going to talk about on how to actually record this. And this is information, guys, that we have to define. We can't switch from one method to another. Once we set up our, um, once we set it up, we have to, we want to stay with our same method. So we're going to be using, so this first part is using the allowance method to record those losses for our uncollectible accounts that we're not going to receive from our customer. So it says the difference between an asset's account balance and its related contra account is the book value. So just like when we did book value of our assets, and remember our customers are our assets, right? So it's still the same thing when we do equipment or or our customers, they're still an asset. So there is still a book value of our accounts receivable. And some, com some companies actually will take their accounts receivable. And they might not have an accounts receivable department. And so they will subcontract that out to a different company. And then that other company collects the money for us. Or if we're in a pinch and we're going to end up declaring bankruptcy and we're getting rid of all of our assets, we might actually sell our customers to a collection agency. So then that collection agency can, can get the money from our customers. That way we sell it to the collection agency. They pay us up front a portion, so it won't be dollar for dollar, but it'll be for a portion of how much our customers owe us, and then that collection agency will collect. So there's a couple of different ways. So we definitely do have a book value of our customers. So the amount in the accounts receivable a business expects to collect is its net realizable value. So we expect to collect probably a good 98% of any kind of receivable that we have out there from our customers. We might set it up and say, okay, we expect not to collect about 2% overall. Or we, when we go over the aging method, we'll expect not to, you know, to collect different, you know, at different points in time, different percentages. And so, but we, you kind of expect at some point that when you're running a business that you might not have a customer pay you. So like I said, there's two common methods that we use, what we call is percentage of sales method. So, no, and those are sales on account. So we look at the, we look at those sales on account and we say, okay, we're not going to collect. We assume, remember what assuming means, but we're going to assume we're not going to collect about 1% or 2%, you know, depending on how many 
sales on account you do. And that, and we, we, we base it on the total sales and then we multiply it by whatever percent we have estimated. Then there's the percent of accounts receivable method, which we do by aging. So we look at, you know, how much, um, how much we have that are, you know, 30 to 30, 30 to 60 days, you know, 60 to 90 days. We look at that and we base a percentage on that. So we're going to, in this first pun, we're going to do our aging. So here's an example of our chart. So we have our accounts receivable as of December 31st. And then it has on the left hand side, it has all of our customers listed, all of their account balances listed. And current means for those that have just charged. So like within the last couple of days, right? So those are all of uh, just charged. And notice that percentage, the, the percent line down at the very bottom. So for those people that just charged, we're going to assume that we might not receive 1% of that. If they're 1 to 30 days, which is still, which is still relatively current, we're going to assume that we're not going to receive 4% of that amount. And then we have over here the 31 to 60 days. Notice that percent jumps up a lot. It jumps up to 12%. 61 to 90 days past due. So that means that, you know, they should have paid 90 days ago or three months ago. It jumps up to 30%. And then over 90 days, it's a whopping 80%. We're going to assume we're not going to get about 80% of that. So that's how we actually figure out the aging portion. So we put it in a chart. Easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? This would be a great Excel um, practice doing some um, formulas. So we have our current, we list all of our all of our totals here, and then their percentage. We figure it out. Then we figure out how much we've already written off. So in this case, we've already written off the hundred. Let me move this out of the way so we can see. We've already written off 125. So this is going to be, this 2300 is going to be in addition to that 125. So these two numbers added together is going to work, is going to equal what we assume we're going to end up writing off. And that number right here is going to be our adjusting entry. Okay. So that adjusting entry, like I said, and we're going to look and see, here it is. So when we put in our adjusting entry, remember, we're adjusting it from where it was to where it should be. So we have, this is how much our accounts receivable was. Remember at the end of the, so we're at the end of the year. We're assuming we're not going to get so much. We've already written off $125. The, the, Difference is that $2,384.10 from the amount that we cal ca calculated. And so that's the amount of our adjustment. Because remember, the adjustment is always the difference. So it's the difference between the beginning and the end. The beginning and the end. All right. So we have, we're going to have to write some stuff off. So, which means that those people that don't pay us, we're going to have to, we're going to have to write off their account and, you know, put it down to zero and just, and it's a good lesson. And it also gives us, if we write it off, it gives us an opportunity. If they do try and come and charge again, we're just like, oh, I'm sorry. We had to write off your account last time. So, you know, if you want to buy from us, we're going to only extend, you know, we're only going to have to collect cash. So we're going to, so counseling out, out their balance, that's that writing off. Now, if we were to do this by hand, and this is, you know, and, and when I go through this with my, um, when we go through by hand in class, not in MindTap itself, 
Um, I actually have them right written off when we post the information in the ledger. So then that way they it's not just a it doesn't look like a regular transaction because really truly it's not. It's not a regular transaction. Yes, we yes, I would say we anticipate it to happen, but when we journalize it in that account area, when we when we post it in our ledger, I literally write the word written off. So then that way, if I ever, like I said, they ever come back and they want to charge, I can be like, oh, no, sorry. We don't have, you know, we're not allowing you to charge anymore. So on this one, January 24, uh, 25th, we wrote off Edmond Hospital's past due accounts as uncollectible, $639.88, memorandum 58. So remember, we're working in our special journals. So what journal do we put memorandums in? I'll give you a second. All right. So hopefully you picked general journal. So it's not a cash payment. It's not a cash receipt. It's not a sale on account and it's not a purchase. So the only other journal is general. So this is what that transaction is going to look like. So we have the 25th. Notice if this was the first one, you would say January, but you see the line above this line right here. That means that those are still January transactions. So we have allowance for uncollectible accounts. This is my asset. This is an asset account. And it's going to be debited for $639.88. And then we have our accounts receivable slash Edmonds Hospital. And notice we have the slash in the post reference for 639. So this takes it out of Edmonds Hospital account and out of our accounts receivable. And it puts it into a kind of holding pattern here in our allowance for uncollectible accounts. And we'll we'll sit on that holding pattern for a while until we until we do our adjusting entries. So we're gonna sit on that. So this is how we, you know, just write off their account and set it in that holding pattern in our allowance. So now when you post, like I said, right here under the item, I would literally write the word, like it says here, written off. So you don't want, so then that way, when we look at Edmonds Hospital, we know that that amount, it wasn't a payoff. Because if we don't write it here it just looks like they paid off their account if there was nothing there it looks like on the 25th oh they paid off their account but they didn't so we want the word written off there and then we actually then we update the allowance account and the accounts receivable account to take those two amounts out so if you look up here notice we have our two accounts in our post reference so it uh, never fails. As soon as you write off the account, you receive a check. And you're like, oh my gosh, why couldn't I have received this check five days ago? So it, when, whenever you have, whenever you've written off account and then all of a sudden, boom, here comes a check, um, you have to reopen the account and then you pay it off. So there's going to be two transactions for this. So notice it says March 9th. So this isn't right after, but it's like a couple months, right? January 25th, March 9th. Received cash and full payment of Edmonds Hospital account. Previously written off as uncollectibles, $639.88. Memorandum number 71. So we know that part of it's going to go into the general journal. That's that memorandum. And then receipt number 695. So if it's receipt number, it should be going into, if you said cash receipts journal, you would be correct. So the other half is going to go into cash receipts journal. So we're going to post, we're going to put it in two different places. So here's the first one. We've got to reopen the account. Okay, that's the first step. So basically, we're going to go into the general journal, and we're going to do the same transaction, but flipped. So we're going to flip it. So here's March 9th, 
accounts receivable M in hospital is now on top as the debit. There's my M71. And then my allowance for uncollectible accounts is my credit for 639.88. So basically I did the same transaction for the written off, but I flipped it. So I'm putting it back into my accounts receivable, back into Edmonds Hospital, and I'm taking it out of that kind of holding period allowance for uncollectible accounts. So that's what it looks like journalized. And then now I'm going to put it into the cash receipts journal. So I'm going to go in. Here's my ninth Edmonds Hospital. This is just like a normal payment. R695 all the way to the accounts receivable column and then cash debit. Notice we're not giving them a discount because obviously, you know, it's taken them. We had to write it off three months previous. It's taken them a long time to pay. We only give discounts for those that pay within 10 days or 15 days. All right. So now this is posting for this write off, right? So we've had to open it back up and we have closed it back. So down here on our customer and our admin, notice that we had our original write off right here where we wrote off. So then on March 9th, when we reopen that account, so when we post this transaction, we're going to write reopen account and then we're going to put in where then we're going to put in our CR because remember, we always put where we got the information from, what journal and page number, and then we'll record the payment. So notice this is a regular payment, so there's nothing written here in the item. So all three of those, that transaction again will be reversed. So here it is reversed. There's our original credit, and then it goes into debit. So our original debit goes into credit. And then everything goes back to normal. Now, so that's for writing off and accepting. Now, here's the deal. We get a customer and they're a good customer and they say, hey, we just don't have the money right this minute, but we promise we are going to pay you. So we as a business have an option to do what's called a promissory note. So a promissory note is kind of like a loan, right? Where it's kind of like a loan where we're allowing a customer to extend their time to pay us. So we're going to, so we're going to create something what's called a notes receivable. So like I said, it's kind of like a loan. We're actually going to charge our customers interest for extending that payment time. So this is not something, like I said, we want to do a lot, but we, if they're a really good customer, we might actually want, you know, we might actually do this for them. So we're going to do something called a notes receivable. And so we're going to show the, how to collect for the notes receivable. And then what happens when that notes receivable becomes what we call dishonorable, which means that they didn't pay, even though we extended their time. So let's say maybe we extended their time 90 days at the end of that 90 days, they still didn't pay us. So this is how we're going to deal with that. So like I said, that promissory note is a promise. And so it's a written promise. And you guys, if you guys ever go to college, which hopefully you will, you know, at least something, you know, two year, four year trade school, and you have to take out a student loan, you will sign a promissory note promising to pay back the amount that you borrow plus your interest. So a promissory note signed by a business and given to a creditor is entered into the note books as notes payable. So a promissory note that a business accepts from a customer is notes receivable. So if we wanted, if you know, we bought something on account and we had to extend our time to pay our vendor or our creditor, we would have, that would be considered a note payable. If we have our customer that needs to extend it, that's a notes receivable, payable and receivable, guys. It's, a, you know, 
we know what those means, vendors, creditors, customers. So the person or the business that signs a note and thus promises to make payment is called the maker of the note. So in our case of our notes receivable, our customer is going to be the maker of the note because they're the ones that are going to be signing it and promising to pay us. So the business to whom the amount of the note is payable, so we would be the P, we would be the payee on that promissory note. So our customer would be the maker, we would be the payee, and the principal is the original amount of the note. So let's say they owed us $2,500, that's going to be the principal. We're going to charge them interest, 6%. And then there is a maturity date. That's the date that they have to pay us by. And then, of course, we have the time of the note. And that says how many days. So it can be 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 180 days. We don't do 365 or 360 because, you know, in accounting one, for some reason in the book, it goes by 360 because I think of bank holidays. And so it will define the terms. So we're going to show you how this works. So this is kind of what a general promissory note that we would use for our business looks like. So it has a note number on there, the date, the name of the people that are promising to pay us. In this case, it's Skinner College. And we are three green products. They're doing a 90 day note. So 90 days from the date and the principal sum of 2,578.35. So that's what they originally owed us. And we're giving them an additional 90 days to pay it. But here's the kicker. So with interest from the date at a rate of 8%. So then we have to calculate how many days are 90 days from March 18th. Well, then you have to know the number of days in the month. And this is where, for some reason, I don't know why people get confused. So I'll show you how this works. And then, of course, then it's signed. All right, I'll go through all that stuff. So we're accepting that notes receivable. So that means that we have to take it out of accounts receivable because it's no longer an accounts receivable, right? And it becomes now kind of like a loan, right? Because now we're charging interest. So we're going to put it into notes receivable and we're going to take it out of notes receivable and their account. So that's what that transaction is going to look like. It's a memory or it's a note. So it's not a receipt, not a not a check, you know, so then that way you know it doesn't fit any of those other things, so it's got to go in the general journal. So this is what it looks like when it's journalized. So it is taking it out of the accounts receivable in Skinner College and putting it into that notes receivable. So now this is how we figure out how much they're going to have to pay in interest. So they have taken all on there. So here's my principal. This was the amount of the original amount. This was the original amount. This is the amount of annual interest. So annual means a full year, right? 12 months, 360 days. So over here, we have to put this in as a fraction because this is our time. So this is the one that you're going to have to do your math first. So fraction of time. They use 360. I think it's because then it's kind of easier to, to divide. So 90 over 360. Well, how many times does 90 go into 360? Oh, if you answered one, if you answered four times, that creates that one fourth, which is 25%. So we need to change the fraction to a decimal. And that way it's easier to calculate. If you change the fraction to a decimal and you guys are like, oh my God, now we're getting into some math. Yes, just a little bit, not much. 
So you divide these two, 90 by 360, or 360 by 90, sorry. That gives us our 25%, so our 0.25, right, 0.25. And then we take this times the 0 0.08 times the 0.25, and that gives us $51.57. This is how much interest they're going to have to pay us for allowing them to extend another 90 days. So now they have to pay us the principal plus the interest. So at the end of that 90 days, now they have to pay us $2,629.92 instead of just the $2,578.35. I hope that makes sense. And when we go to the work togethers, it'll, we'll work through some problems. So now we have to figure out that maturity date. So remember, we're talking about the days of the month. So hopefully you guys know, remember the knuckles? Remember the knuckle things? If you hit on a knuckle, it's 31. If you don't hit on a knuckle, it's, it's less than 31. Okay, so remember you have, oops, if I can see it, January, February, March has 31. April has 30, May has 31, June has 30, July has 31, August 30, okay, and then you have September has 30, right, or August has 31, yeah, August has 31, September has 30, and then you just keep going, so there's that whole knuckle thing. So on this day, so here's our 90 days. So here's our first day. So they did 18th through the 31st. So you have, so we have to calculate how many days are left. So they have 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So they did not count the 18th. So just be aware of that. So the 18th was the day that signed it. So they did the 19th, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. So they don't count that first day. So just be aware of that. They don't count the first day. So they have 19 day or 13 days left to pay in March. So they subtract that from the 90, gives us 77 days left. Well, April, there's only 30 days, so that gives us 47 days. So all I'm doing is subtracting down. May, there's 31, so I'm going to subtract that down. That gives me 16 days in June, and so now that means that we have 16 days in the month of June, and that means that the payment date will be June 16th, and that leaves us with zero days remaining. So when you do the maturity date for the promissory note, do not count that first day. Just as a reminder, don't count the first day. All right. So we have a new account. We have a couple of new accounts. Notes receivable is new. Interest income, because obviously we're making interest, right? We're earning income off the interest that we didn't before. So interest income is going to be like one of our revenue, like our other revenue accounts. And so um, that's also a new account. So notes, notes receivable is an asset because it's money that's owed to us, right? It's an asset. Interest income is a revenue account. It's what we call an other revenue account, but it's a revenue account because we're making money. Okay, so those are our two new accounts. So this is what it looks like when we journalize it. So we have received the money. So we've gone to June 16th. They, we've received their payment. It spells out the terms of the note at the top, and then it gives us the information that we actually need. So the note receivable itself was for the, in the general column, notice in the general, because we don't have it in here, because it's not a receivable anymore. So we're taking it out of the note. That's the original principal. 
we're putting in our interest that we earned, which is the 5157 that we calculated. And then this is how much they sent the check for. And it's receipt number 782. So the notes receivable is just the principal. The interest is what we calculated. And then the cash is what they actually sent us. Now, what happens if they don't pay us? So we're going to turn it back into a receivable plus interest. So here's the deal. On June 3rd, Stout Company dishonored the notes receivable number four, 60-day, 8% note, maturity value due today. So the original principal was 33000 your interest, they already calculated it for us, was $40. And so now they owe us $3,040. So, and it's Memorandum 98. So where are we going to put that? General Journal. So here we go. So we're going to reopen an accounts receivable slash stout company. Now they owe us $3,040. And then we're going to take it out of the note and we're going to put it into income, interest income, because they're going to pay us because they agreed to pay us the interest. So it's going to go back into an accounts receivable. We're going to start the letters again. And then I'm sure if they come back and say, hey, can we do another note? We probably won't. We'll be like, no you are going to pay us or we're going to send you to collections or whatever. All right. So that is chapter 14. So that's kind of where we're at. And it's kind of bringing the last little bit of stuff together before we start the end of the period stuff. So, Hey, everybody have a great day. Thanks for watching.